I will say this about investing. Everything you do learn is cumulative. What I learned at 20 is useful. Equity. Welcome to another episode of Equity Mates, a podcast where we follow our journey of investing. Whether you're an absolute beginner or approaching Warren Buffett status, our aim is to help break down your barriers from beginning to dividend. My name is Bryce, and as always, I'm joined by my equity buddy, Ren. How are you going? I'm very good, Bryce. I'm excited for this episode, but I am also excited because reporting season is finally over. Yes, it's been quite the journey over the last almost eight weeks yeah. with US. Yeah, but you know what the good news is, Bryce? What's that? We're recording this on the 1st of September. American reporting season kicks off in October. <laughs> <laughs> we still haven't aligned on is it earnings or reporting oh, true, season. <laughs> true, true, true. Yeah, well, you know, we've just got through full year results in Australia. Before that, we had Q2 results in America uh, and Europe and we're about to hit Q3 results. Yes. Never stops. Never <laughs> stops, never stops. So, a uh, big episode today. We're covering what we've learned this week. Um, no guarantees on whether or not it's quality or not, but what we've learned. <laughs> the end of reporting season, what companies have caught our eye. Ren and I go head to head, stick around for that. And uh, then we're just going to close it out with our overall takeaways from reporting yeah. season around the world. Yeah. It's been a fascinating few weeks or month or two, really. I mean, it never stops. There's no. a fire hose of information and we've definitely contributed to that fire hose in trying to keep people up to date on the podcast, what companies are reporting, what we're learning from it. But I think at this point, we need to take a deep breath and say, all right, what did we actually learn? Not from a company level, but just overall. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And then we can Oof. take a break. Then we can move on. Well, we can't take a break because uh, <laughs> Equity Mates, but this is getting released on a Monday. We're recording it on a Thursday because... Friday morning, we're going on a plane to Macau for Bryce's Bucks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, by the time this is released, we would be back. Yeah, I won't but be here on Monday. We will be you then probably, recording. So anyway, you probably we'll, won't be here on Monday. You guys will get an up, <laughs> you guys will get an update soon enough. But it is, is is exciting times in hindsight. Anyway, all right, Ren, let's kick it off. So, uh, what have I learnt this week? <laughs> what have you learnt? Firstly, <laughs> the program is done for Finfest, oh. and I'm super pumped for it. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, I made a joke uh, yesterday that you and M uh, will be getting a LinkedIn endorsement for event management <laughs> after um, after this event comes off. A lot of work has been going into it, but the Program's all... done. Speaker lineup is ready. If you want to have a look at it, jump online. 50 plus experts from around Australia coming to share their wisdom and insights. There's some epic sessions yes, coming. Andrew yes. Brown has one that I cannot wait to listen to. Charlie Viola, Michelle Hepworth, Nick Griffin, you name it. Equitymates.com slash FinFest. It is powered by Stake. So thanks to the guys over at Stake for supporting it. Tickets are selling fast. They're only 47 bucks, but yep. there are plenty of discount codes out there. There you- <laughs> are. Yeah. And um, for investors of any level, we've programmed it so there will be, I guess, different streams throughout the day. Yep. Uh, beginner investors, uh, more uh, sort of intermediate ETF and managed fund investors, <laughs> individual stock investors. And then, and then yeah, <laughs> to the moon. To the moon. And then also we've uh, got a number of sort of business leaders and uh, we're going to talk entrepreneurship as well. So yep. a massive lineup, uh, more sessions than you could ever dream of. Yeah. Well, depends how big you dream, I guess, but <laughs> uh, that should be exciting. But Bryce, is that really what you've learned? This no, week? Ren, there's a couple of other things. Um, we're not out of the woods just yet, but I think you're going to touch on that. So I won't delve too deeply into that. Just a reminder this week of how quickly things can turn. Yeah. Um, uh, so we won't delve into that. A hundred and another little stat I found, 109 days is the number, Ren. US is in drought. Do you have any idea what I'm talking about? Well, there's a heat wave across the Northern Hemisphere. China's in drought. The Yangtze River's dried up. Hydroelectric <laughs> uh, shortages in Europe. We've seen wildfires, wildfires and drought. And then at least a couple of weeks ago, 100 million Americans were suffering a heat wave. I assume that's what you mean? No, but um, that is all the literal drought. 
the US IPO market is in drought. Oh, oh right. Okay. <laughs> 109 days is the longest streak since 2008 of uh, no IPO. No, at all. Over 25 million bucks, raising 25 million bucks. Essentially, who goes to an IPO for raising less than 25 million? Well, not, not a lot. We might wonder. <laughs> we, hopefully more. <laughs> but uh, it's interesting to see that it's absolutely dried up over in the States. Yeah, well. and, and playing out here as well in Australia. The drought. Yeah. Yeah, longest longest run of consecutive days since two thousand and eight. So what what do we learn from that? Um, that if you were if we were ever to IPO, you want to go when the market's hot. <laughs> yeah, well, they talk about an IPO window, and you know a lot of those companies listed. There was a flurry of listings in um, last year because the IPO window was open. Investors were willing to put money into IPOs. I guess. The IPO window is not open at the moment. No, very much not. There's an interesting um, history of IPO windows opening and closing though. Generally, what you find is there's a big IPO that resets investors' expectations. So, I'm pretty sure out of the 2000, 2001 crash, it was Google in 2004. They um, they IPO'd and that sort of was like, oh, okay, we can breathe. And people talk about the Facebook IPO, at least in the tech world, the Facebook IPO in 2012 being that moment out of the 08, 09 financial crisis as the sort of reset and the window starts to reopen. So I guess what we should be looking for is the the reset IPO probably in a year or two. My bold prediction, Stripe would be that. Well, that's not that bold. But uh, I mean like... That's actually the- really not bold at all. <laughs> <laughs> sure, go puff. <laughs> that is <bold. laughs> I, anyway. I would say the likely candidate Stripe. Um, in China, you've got Shein and ByteDance. Uh, Reddit is one that's often talked about. Instacart looked like they were preparing for a big IPO. Equity mates. Equity mates. <laughs> <laughs> but they're probably some of the bigger names. Sp- uh, SpaceX won't go public. Oh, it could. That's another big... It might at some point. Anyway, we're in drought. Okay, we're that's looking, really interesting. I, didn't, looking, I had no idea about that. We're looking that. for a drought breaker. But what I really learned this week, Ren, and it took me back to a conversation that we had with Michael Frazis around his theory of investing in companies that are loved by their customers. Okay. He said Tesla is an example, that Apple is an example, yeah. where customers just are almost cult followers of the brand, okay. regardless of what they do. What? Okay. And it led me to do a bit of digging. Two weeks ago, I think we spoke about... Well, we've spoken about Disney a fair bit. Heaps. Sports betting, pumping out... Um, Have you seen their, their latest thing? So last week, they were talking about getting into sports betting. This week, they apparently have a secret project called Disney Prime. That's not what it will actually be called, but they want to make a knockoff of Amazon Prime. Why? Well, membership services are good. Yeah, but they they're like I feel like... My, my thing here is they should... That like. What I've learned this week is they should stick to parks. Okay. (laughs) I mean, some some may argue that they have a bit of success with uh, making movies. Okay, yeah. Aside from that, sack the streaming. Sack the streaming. You had fun at Disney on Ice? No, no. (laughs) Sack the streaming. It's too much of a chain. Ball and chain at the moment. Anyway, what I wanted... That is a bad take what I What I wanted to look at was... Uh, what's actually going on with their parks? Because last week or a week before we spoke about the profits that that they'd made and I think we said, parks are back. Someone yelled that in the studio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We might have edited it out, but, but it was yelled. <laughs> but, but what does that mean? So they turned a profit of 5.4 billion, uh, sorry, rev of 5.4 and profit of 1.6. What have they done though? Because we've got inflation, we've got economic, pretty tough economic conditions. Uh, when there's still restrictions at the parks. So levels are still lower than pre-pandemic levels. Yeah. Attendance is down 17%, but but revenue is up 17%. And this is an example of com- good companies just getting it done with a customer base that will spend whatever. So what they've done is jacked the prices yeah. on everything. Yeah. I think they call it yield management. <laughs> yield management. Yeah, That's yeah, exactly yeah. what they call it. Yeah. And so they've done these small little things where... You now pay to come into the park, but then there's everything else. There's an app that you download. Yeah, Genie, Genie Plus. Genie Plus. Yeah, 17, oh, $17, 17 a, a day, a day yeah. per person. Oh and and what does that give you? It gives you the ability to skip unreserved lines, which used to be free if you paid a little 
extra for a total ticket. Okay. But then if you want to get to the front of a reserved line, you then have to have Genie plus pay an additional 17 bucks. <laughs> so then there's, uh, then there's merchandise, there's all the food that's there. Here's an interesting stat though. 50% of their park's revenue comes from annual ticket holders. Right, okay. These are people that buy tickets, uh, an annual pass to Disney for $1,600 a year wow. and go upwards of 100 times a year. 100 times a year? <laughs> yeah. what? what they do, they are putting stories of it and these are most loved customers. And in fact, Disney kind of hate them now because they don't spend anywhere near as much money as a family who comes in once. Right, okay. And so they're kind of trying to get rid of all these annual pass holders and swing it more to people who just come once. Because pe- customers who come once, it's a life dream. They'll max yeah, out yeah, credit yeah, cards. Yeah. They'll spend five grand. An annual pass holder who comes in once after work, literally they're like, I'll drive home from work, run in, grab a ride, grab an ice cream, go home. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a strange <laughs> luxury for a company to decide they hate a customer segment. I know. I know, it's fascinating. Anyway, the reminder from me and what I learned was that there are these companies that despite what's going on in the macro environment, there were, there were interviews with these customers of people who are spending thousands and thousands of dollars to live out these life dreams, spending my, whatever it takes to go there and, and Disney are leaning into it hard. Now you could argue, is it fair? Will this last? But I mean, I think it will. It just... It gives me the ick. It is pretty, yeah. This but like, whole story. It's like yield management, all this stuff. It's basically like we're just going to target the wealthiest customers and just, just clean them out and we'll just, we won't worry about the rest of our customers. Well, the thing is that um, the, the argument Disney make in this instance, because yes, uh, I felt the same. They're just like suppliers outstripping demand. So we're just going to do it until our customers turn around and say, it's way too expensive. We're not going to come to your parks. Yeah, but there's a, there's a certain level of demand in, in elasticity um, where prices rise, but your kids still want to go. Yeah, true. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, anyway, it's, it's, it's fascinating. It, is an it just re- story. reminded me of that convo we had with Frazis, who's just like, you know, there's an investment thesis you can make. And I'm not saying this is one for Disney, but just thinking about those companies that can have this somewhat pricing power based on that sort of cult following of, yeah. uh, of a customer base. Um, and, you know, the profit that they're making here versus the com- competition they're facing in the streaming business. Um, but, but you would argue that there's a level of, uh, probably not cross-selling is the right word, but like uh, the only reason the parks can stay as popular as they are is if the next generation of kids l- fall in love, love Disney. with Disney characters. Mm. And how do you do that? Well, you have to be where they're watching and mm. engaging with content. And mm. the Disney Channel on Foxtel or cable <laughs> TV isn't going to cut it that's anymore because that's it. not where the next generation of kids are yeah. watching. Yeah. So you would argue that without a good entertainment offering and a streaming service, they're just going to become a six flags or something. <laughs> <laughs> true, true, true. Anyway, that's what I learned, Ren. What have you got? Fascinating. So my big learning this week is that in 2022, good news is bad news. Okay. And I think this really sums up the macro environment and where the market is at a at a overall level. Uh, two economic data points were released this week, last week when you're listening to this. Uh, job openings in the US rose in July to 11.2 million. Uh, so, so meaning more jobs available? 11.2 million jobs were being advertised. Companies were trying to hire 11.2 million people. That being up is a great sign for business. Businesses have the money, have the revenue coming in, have the money on in the bank to invest in growth and mm-hmm. hire new people. Mm-hmm. So that's a really good sign of the health of the economy. The second job, uh, the second data point, consumer confidence. So for three straight months, consumer confidence was declining as inflation was high or uh, gas prices were high, all of that stuff. The index was at 95 in July and it rose to 103 for August. Okay. So businesses are still hiring. Businesses were trying to fill more jobs in July than in June and consumers were more confident in August than they were in July. Two great data points, but the stock market collapsed on that news. Jeez. And the reason that is that in 2022, good news is bad news because what it shows is that the economy is holding up, that the interest rate rises that we're seeing are being borne by businesses and the consumer and they're still 
trying to hire and relatively confident. And what that means is they can raise interest rates more. Well, yeah, it means that what the Fed wants, which is to cool things down a bit, it's not having the current measures that they've put in place aren't having the effect that they want. Yeah, well, I think inflation... I mean, I don't want to say it's peaked, but it feels like the, the rate of growth is slowing. But is it, it's obviously still higher than... It's still high, yeah, yeah, than, yeah. ...than yeah. The, the Fed would, would, would like. Yeah, so I think it's having... The interest rate rises, you could say, are having some effect, but people have often said that the Fed and central banks around the world have this very narrow path to walk between managing inflation but not tanking the economy and doing it. And we may only be a few steps down that path, but... At this stage, they're still on the path. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Jerome Powell, um, at the time of recording last Friday, Australian time or US time, came uh, came out and suggested that it's likely their interest rate approach is probably going to be a bit more aggressive yeah. from now than they anticipate. And, yeah. and if you're wondering why your portfolio has taken a beating over the last few days, that's why. Yeah. Jerome Powell said that in the market, the American stock market fell 3%. Yeah. yeah. Tanked. Yeah. Um, <laughs> The reason why, just uh, to take a step back, the reason why higher interest rates... So, the economy is good. You would normally expect when the economy is good, the stock market goes up because people are feeling confident about Mm. the state of businesses. But the two reasons why the stock market falls uh, is because when interest rates go up, the cost of money increases. It's more expensive to borrow money um, because you have to repay more in the interest. Um, and so that will lead to less economic activity. Consumers will spend less because they'll borrow less. Businesses will spend less because they'll borrow less. So that's number one. And number two is that valuations will fall. Yeah. The, uh, the way that you value an asset is the present value of cu- future cash flows. Uh, as interest rates go up, the discount rate that you use to value those future cash, cash flows also goes up. And so the present value decreases. So is the lesson here for the week, Ren, that uh, any good news should be a short the market vibe? <laughs> well, I don't short the market. Good. And I don't think You've you should the either. Test. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I think it's just like this is the explanation. Yeah. The, this yeah. is uh, as much as we like to be individual, like bottom up, looking at companies. Right now, the overall state of interest rates and the macro economy is driving market movements. And this is why we're seeing some positive economic data, but then the stock market falls. Mm. The interesting thing is the inverse. Like if we see shocking economic data, do people think, oh, well, the Fed won't raise interest rates and then does the stock market rise? No, I don't think so. I'd have no idea. Yeah, well, depends. Maybe, it depends maybe how- good news is bad news, but bad news is also depends bad Depends how shocking because if it's too bad a news... Then people are going to be like, oh, the Fed's gone too far. We've killed the economy. We're going to recession, blah, blah, blah. But if it's kind of like on the nose bad news, oh, this is where we want it, stocks could be like, hell yeah. This is the kind of <laughs> insightful economic analysis people come to Equity Mates for. Anyway, yeah. that's what we've learned. That's what we've learned. Love it. We'll bring something next week if we've learned something. Um, because at the time of recording, we're about to go into four days of fucks. So. Yeah, well, I think we're going to learn a lot about you over this weekend. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. Okay, well, Ren, um, as we said at the top, reporting season is finally over. So here are 10 companies that have caught our eye. Yeah, so um, let's start with just a couple of general ones. And then we've grouped uh, resources. We've got dairy, uh, which we'll get to. And then retail corner. You're the retail whisperer. We'll always get there. But two companies that caught our eye, uh, Zip, Zip Pay, the Mm -hmm. buy now, pay later um, company. Revenue up 57% Mm -hmm. to $620 million. Not bad. Yeah. Uh, But they made a loss of $1.1 billion. The important thing is like a lot of tech companies, they're cutting costs. So they've pulled out of the United Kingdom and retreating back to Australia and the US. Um, uh, that That's a story that we're seeing across a lot of tech businesses. All right, Ren. Nine Entertainment here in Australia. Revenue up 15% to $2.7 billion. Profit up a staggering 71% to $315 million, And they push, push their dividend up 27% to $0.07. Cents. However, Stan, their subscription video platform, made $381 million in revenue, rising 22% in the year. But the costs associated with running the service, particularly for Stan's sport, 
which I don't even really watch, meant Stan ended up with a $28 million in earnings, down 28% on the year. Well, you obviously don't watch the Wallabies. I don't. Or tennis. I don't really know. Because they're the two sports that they have. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Uh, I have a gripe with Nine Entertainment. So for people of not you do. For, for, <laughs> <laughs> for people not familiar with Nine Entertainment, uh, that Nine is one of our big TV stations here in Australia. They bought Fairfax, which is our second biggest news publisher, like newspaper publisher. I hate that they kept entertainment. Wait, you mean the word? Yeah, like. Your, it would be like the, if the New York Times called themselves New York Times Entertainment. Oh, I see. Yeah, okay. yeah. Or like Wall Street Journal Entertainment. <laughs> or no, rather than Fox News, Fox Entertainment. It's like why? It's why does like, it matter? I don't know. It's like a new. <laughs> it's a. It's a. It's a leg. It's like a legacy established news business. It's not entertainment, and I know like news can be entertaining, <laughs> and they have sport. The the perception that news is entertainment is one of the biggest reasons that the quality of news has deteriorated <laughs> over the last couple of decades. All right, why don't you write a letter to the board? Well, this is an open letter to the board. <laughs> <laughs> just change it. Just just call it nine. Or just call it entertainment. No. <laughs> All right, let's move on. Resources, Ren. Uh, Linus. Revenue was up 88% to $920 million and profit up a staggering 244% to $541 million. Do the maths on that margin. Linus reaped an average okay, price of... it's about 60%. Yeah, <laughs> not bad. Linus reaped an average price of $60.30 per kilogram for its rare earth oxide in 2021 to 22, compared to $29.00. Uh, in a year earlier. And for those unaware, um, Linus is a rare earth miner. Um, all those, which is in pretty pretty important. In like electronics. In, and Yeah, like all that. this yeah. small tech stuff. Yeah, China has a massive uh, market share in the rare earth me- metals uh, mm. market. Linus is one of the few producers that are not in China. Mm. Uh, so we've got a oil company, an iron ore company, and a coal company to go in resources. And I think the story that you hear is a similar story in all of them. Not as much in iron ore, but let's start with the oil. Woodside Energy, um, after their merger with BHP's oil assets, I, I, they're the biggest oil company in Australia now. Revenue up 132% to $5.8 billion. Profit, Bryce, profit up 414% to $1.6 billion. I have to say it. Dividend, well, do you? Broadly speaking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, dividend up 263% to $1.09. Uh, profit surge. So they also have a number of natural gas assets. Natural gas prices have been surging. Uh, the, there's also a contribution for the part of the year post the merger. Um, but yeah, oil companies. I mean, I feel like we've said it every week that we've yeah. been doing these earnings wraps. So that's oil. Talk to me about iron ore, Bryce. Fortescue Metals, company that's spoken about quite a bit in the Equimets community. Revenue up 20% to $17.4 billion. Profit up 52% to $6.2 billion. But they, they have reduced their dividend um to the tune of almost 50%, down 43% to $1.21. Now, we say this every time. Andrew Forrest, Twiggy, the uh, founder of Fortescue, he'll take home a whopping $2.34 billion worth of dividends for the past year alone after the iron ore uh, miner announced better than expected profits and dividends. It blows me away every year uh, um, hearing how much he clears in dividends. And this goes to an episode that we did on uh, Get Started Investing about the value of owning shares over a long period of time. He's he's absolutely killed it. Yes. yes. <laughs> well, he's, he's built an incredible business. Unbelievable. Yeah. Unbelievable. So we've covered rare earths. We've covered oil and gas. We've covered iron ore. Let's talk about coal. Yep. Whitehaven Coal, they were unloved and... Right now, they're back. They're back, uh, at least for some people. Revenue up two hundred and sixteen percent to just shy of five billion dollars. Profit up four hundred and fifty nine percent to just shy of two billion dollars. They're paying a dividend after not paying one last year. You would think so after almost a five hundred percent increase in profit. Yeah, uh, forty cent dividend. Um, coal prices are just on a tear. On a tear, yeah. and. 
Uh, we'll, we'll talk about we'll talk about where commodities are going a little bit later in the episode. So let's leave it there. Um, Bryce, we've got two dairy companies. I'll talk about them, then you talk about the retail companies. I wouldn't dare talk about your retail <laughs> companies. But we we want to talk about dairy in particular because I think this is a story of uh, two... This is two companies, one that got access to the US market and one that didn't. Now, the backstory for people who aren't familiar, the US uh, has been living through a infant formula shortage after Abbott Nutrition had a contamination scare in a lab in Michigan. Uh, The US market is incredibly concentrated. So as a result, basically the US government started giving emergency authorizations for foreign companies to send infant formula to the United States. Mm -hmm. One Australian company got that authorization, Bubs. Mm -hmm. One Australian company did not, well, one New Zealand company didn't get that authorization, A2 Milk. Now let's talk about their results. Bubs reported revenue up 127% to $89 million. A2 Milk reported revenue up 20% to $1.4 billion. Um, Bubs, not profitable still, even with this massive demand coming from the US. Um, Their infant formula sales did jump 177% 177% for the year, mainly because of the US. Um, they have a number of goat milk products. They actually grew as well, 36%. Can't say I've ever drunk goat milk, no. but still not profitable. A2 Milk didn't get the US US authorization, so they, their revenue didn't grow as much, 20%. Uh, they are profitable though. Their profit was up 52% to $123 million, which is impressive. Um, they can't sell infant formula in America, they can sell milk, and their U.S. liquid milk sales was up thirty percent, wow. which is impressive. In Australia and New Zealand, milk sales are up two percent, not as impressive. But while Bubs is capitalising on the American opportunity, and it should be said that Abbott Nutrition's factory is now back up and running, and so there will be an interesting, I guess, watch this space. Do Bubs maintain an authorization? Do the U.S. say you can no longer sell here? That's in flux at the moment bubs relied on america a2 milk relied on china and with covid and the loss of chinese buyers sending product back to china their business there really dried up so now they're trying to really build their china business again but an interesting stat price the number of births in china fell 12 percent in 2022 oh wow so when you're thinking about a company that makes infant formula that's not a good long-term trend. No. Well, that might just be a blip, but yeah, surprising. 12%, that's a big fall. That is a big fall. So anyway, that's the story of two Australia and New Zealand milk companies. And now let's get to retail. All right, Ren. So two, actually four companies, but we'll start with two and then you and I are going to go head to head to close out retail earnings. So the first one, Wes Farmers, uh, they are home, or they own Bunnings, Kmart, Target, And Officeworks here in Australia, massive retailer, revenue up 9% to 36.8 billion. Profit was down though, 3%. Still, they managed to get a profit of 2.35 billion and their dividend was up 1% to 1.8. What contributed to this? Well, Bunnings revenue increased 5% to 17.7 billion. Earnings increasing just on 1% though to 2.204 billion. Kmart and Target were a bit of a drag. Earnings for the first half of the financial year were significantly impacted by COVID uh, or COVID related disruptions, I should say. Inventory for those that picked up on my inventory last <laughs> week, uh, supply chain, all, all of the stuff we've been seeing in the news with almost 25% of um, trading lost across those two. And Officeworks also contributed with revenue up 4.6% for the year to $3.16 billion. I love Officeworks. Anyway, Do you? yeah, yeah, I love it. Anyway, oh, okay. Adore Beauty, Ren, we interviewed the founder, Kate Morris, a couple of years ago, online re- retailer for... All things makeup and um, beauty. Dude, it's in the name. It's called Adore Beauty. 
<laughs> it's very true. Revenue up 11% to $200 million, Profit up 181% to $2.4 million. A couple of key stats. Active customers, defined as those that bought things in the last 12 months, were 872,000, up 7% on 2021. Returning customers were up 31% on last year. So more active, more returning, and returning customers contributed um, to the majority of their revenue. Yeah, it's an impressive result for a company that's probably been pretty underloved. Yeah, it's been hammered a bit. So yeah. good to see Tanil O'Shaughnessy, who the girls over in You're in Good Company also in- in- interviewed. So if you want to have a, a listen to Tanil, head over to their podcast. It was well, let's just include interview. both of those links in our show notes. Deal. All right, Rain, it's time for you and I to go. <laughs> it's time for you and I to go head to head. The ultimate retail battle. And that is, of course... Coles versus Woolworths. You're going to take the Coles corner. I'm going to take the Woolworths corner and we're going to see which major retailer has come out on top. Yes. Well, for context, Bryce used to work for Woolworths. I used to work for Coles. That's why we're taking our respective corners. The two, the supermarket duopoly. Yep. We're now far enough away removed from from our employment where we can acknowledge that it's a duopoly. Yes, although I would love to know what is going on with Audi at the moment. Don't they? Didn't they? They, when we were there, they like they were eating, or just before we were there, they were eating into market share pretty meaningfully. They got to sort of ten percent, mm. and then they really stalled. And I think they stalled around sort of like 12, 13, 12 14 think, yeah. percent, and they haven't really been able to make inroads since then. Now's the conditions where they're making inroads, though. That's why I want to. I want to say, uh, yeah, they? I'm exclusively Audi at the moment. Really? Yeah, yeah. Actually, we have been for like four years. I've actually stayed loyal to Coles. Really? Yeah. Which one? Uh, World Square, but I don't actually go to the shops that much these days. <laughs> I'm still on HelloFresh. Oh <laughs> well played. That's unsponsored. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, let's do it, Ren. All right. So, uh, starting with market cap, Woolworths is a lot bigger. $44 billion to $24 billion. Mm. We also have a higher share price, Ren, but that doesn't mean anything. Number of stores, Woolworths outweighs we have 1086 stores in the network compared to coles 836 yeah revenue woolworths did 61 billion dollars in revenue coles did 39 billion i was shocked at that at what just the difference well i mean they've got a different amount of stores they do but i just didn't think it was so far apart 20 billion dollars more for only an extra 200 stores well, I mean, in to Woolworths' credit, on a per store basis, they're they've got more, more revenue. Okay, yeah. nice. All right, that's uh, good to know. So, Woolworths' revenue growth, 9%. Coles' revenue growth, 2%. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> but profit. Now, the profit number was skewed a little bit because Woolworths sold Endeavor. So, I'm, I'm pretty sure this profit number is X Endeavor. And for those who are unaware, Endeavor was our... Um, liquor arm. It had Dan Murphy's and BWS. Yeah. Yeah. So $1.5 billion for Woolworths compared to $1 billion for Coles. So similar margins. Yeah. 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 But uh, Woolworths grew profit X, the Endeavor sale at 1%. Coles grew it at 4%. Okay. Yeah. So who, you know, and the reason for that is because um, you guys passed on more inflation. We didn't. No, your revenue grew at 9%, our no, revenue no. grew at 2%. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Look, um, all I'm saying is if you're growing revenue at 9% and you're only growing profit at 1%, that is a story of no operating leverage. Yeah, it is. That's costs. Whereas Coles yeah, didn't... Yeah, because we've absorbed the costs. We know this. Coles our, our price didn't inflation. Grow, Coles didn't grow revenue that much, which means top line, they weren't charging customers that much more. But profit grew, which shows a disciplined capital <laughs> management and cost cutting program. All it means if you're listening is at home is that Coles doesn't care about the customer and they've passed on all of the inflation to your back pocket. <laughs> what are you talking about? That is not what these numbers are saying. So who comes out on top, Ren? Well, I mean It depends what numbers you look at. They're similar businesses in different colours. Literally. Well, yeah, that's why I said it. Yeah. 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 If you slap a red on a supermarket, it's Coles. Slap a green on, it's Woolworths. The amount of... Yeah. I mean, like, there's there's different reasons to like the businesses, but they're very similar businesses. Yeah. Coles has a brighter future with Ocado and Vitron, though. 
Okay. Well, let's keep moving. <laughs> let's keep moving. Let's turn to a wrap up and just go through some of the key takeaways that we've um, that we've taken from reporting season. Yeah. Okay. So we've listed a lot of companies over the last few weeks, but let's pull out some major themes. Some of the things that we think are worth noting down, and then talk about a few of the companies uh, that really talk to that thesis and i think bryce number one for me the overall takeaway was it was a really good time to be in the resources business but there's a question at the end is the party over well this this uh, i guess the results have been pretty massive um the world's largest oil producer saudi aramco pumped out a 48.4 billion dollar profit in three months alone three months yep. which was almost double what they did the year before which is crazy bhp revenue was up 18 percent. profit was up 173 yeah they we've had spoken a... about whitehaven coal we've spoken about fortescue we've spoken about woodside and we spoke about ampole last week all seeing increases in profit increases in revenue in some instances instances in the hundreds of percent yeah now, so so we saw bumper profits, we saw bumper revenues. Um, Biden had a quote that Exxon makes more money than God. Yeah, like that's <laughs> that. Cool. The, uh, we're seeing conversations about a windfall profits tax on oil and gas companies in the UK and in Ireland. Um, there is a feeling that these resource companies just made too much money in some circles, but we can see that they made a lot of money. The question now is, was that the peak of the cycle? Because for some commodities, we're seeing them soften. We're seeing the price of the commodity, the oil price, the iron ore price fall. So between early June and mid-August, the price of oil has come off 30%, mm. which is great for us mm-hmm. as drivers of cars. Um, the price of iron ore was over $200 a ton at the start of June. It's now back about $100 a ton. So, it's come off massively as well. Uh, On an earnings call, Illumina Limited said that uh, their prices peaked at about $398 a ton. It's now about $330 a ton. So, we're seeing softening of some commodities. Um, The one outlier is coal. Mm. Coal continues to do well with energy crises around the world. We mentioned earlier in this episode that China's hydroelectric power is... Dry, literally drying up because their rivers, um, because of their heat wave. In Europe, they're looking for substitutes for Russian natural gas. Um, they, they, they expect European coal demand to jump 7% this year in a pretty you know, forward-thinking, climate-focused Europe. For, to see coal jump um, is interesting. So the coal price remains the outlier, I guess, but the general question for the commodities market is, have some of the prices peaked and will we see will, will the the earnings season we've just gone through be able to be repeated mm. so that's the number one it was great but will it continue to be great for resources tbc number two ren despite inflation the consumer remains relatively strong we've seen some interesting results from retailers around the world we've spoken about walmart we did home depot um all experiencing revenue growth. Profits were down for some of them though as the impact of inflation on uh, their goods and services came through. But discretionary retail, Ren, the likes of JB Hi-Fi here in Australia, a um, electronics retailer, their revenue was up 4%, profit also up. Temple and Webster Furniture, their revenue was up 31%, although I do recall that they have had a pretty shocking start to the year. Yeah. Um, and I th- think that's something that we're going to see in next reporting season. Super Retail Group, revenue up. Nick Scarly Furniture, revenue up. And Breville, which we spoke about last week, revenue up and profit also up. So they're discretionary retailers. And yeah. as you were just alluding to there, we are we saw good results, but we are seeing warning signs for the consumer. Big time. So you, you mentioned Temple and Webster. Yes, Temple and Webster, they're cycling numbers from COVID. And we're also now starting to see the purchasing habits of consumers changing. Whilst we are still spending, we're moving away from um, discretionary in, into more non-discretionary or private label sort of uh, products. Yeah. And uh, not so much on uh, couches for our 
for our lounge room or fixing up DIY. Yeah. So the, the discretionary retailers, the ones that you just listed there, plenty of others around the world, they'll be the ones to watch because they'll be where revenue starts to dry up first. Mm. Um, we have we saw Dollar Tree and Dollar General over in the US report strong numbers or decent numbers uh, and they're you know, discount dollar stores as, as the name suggests. Walmart reported that they were seeing customers trade down in terms of the quality of their goods. So we are seeing signs that the consumer is not as strong but I think this earnings season showed that that weakness hasn't come through in the numbers yet. Yeah, yet. So number one... It's coming though. It was great. It was a great time for resources. Number two, the consumer is holding on. Number three, tech. Tech. Is, and tech is pulling back. Mm. And there's plenty of examples of this from around the world where the party is over for some of those unprofitable tech companies. We saw it in their share price from sort of November last year. Um, and you know some of them are down like 80, 90% now. But now in this reporting season, we really started to see it in the business numbers as well. So Amazon reported its second quarterly loss in a row. They're really focused on cost cutting. Zip, as we mentioned earlier today, pulling out of the United Kingdom. Robin Hood announced that they're laying off 23% of their staff. Snap uh, announced that they're laying off 20% of their workforce. And they also are scrapping the Pixie drone which is going to be a sad day when we can't throw a drone up in the sky and get it to take selfies of us. In China, Alibaba and Tencent are focused on cutting costs. Tencent reported their first ever revenue decline uh, and Tencent are also selling stakes in some of the businesses that they've invested in to free up cash. F45 and Peloton, the two fitness startups, maybe you don't really call these guys tech, but they certainly call themselves tech. Uh, they're scaling back operations. They both fired their CEO uh, and mm. founder. Uh, even Microsoft Bryce is cutting back on expenses and focusing on corporate travel and business expenses. Their CFO said she would be watching like a hawk. Um, so I think the third big takeaway is that um, it's going to be harder to get a job in tech than it was a year ago. <laughs> yeah, well, a lot to, to uh, unpack from the reporting earnings season that we've just been through. I'm really looking forward to the next one, Ren. As you said, it is just around the corner in terms of the states kicking off. So we're going to take a bit of a breather over the next few weeks. And uh, we're well, not in terms of podcasts, but in terms of earnings. Uh, so Ren, it's great to chat stocks. A reminder, as we said at the top, FinFest tickets are available at equitymates.com slash FinFest. They're only $47. It's pretty much uh, the best investment that you're going to make this in the second half of this year. Yeah. As and markets are down. If uh, for nothing else, we're not going to share any bucks party stories on the podcast but if you see bryce at finfest or you see me at finfest you might be able to get some stories out of us <laughs> that alone is deal. worth the ticket price deal fair call <laughs> all right ren well great to chat uh, as always and we'll pick it up next week sounds good i will say this about investing everything you do learn is cumulative what i learned at 20 is useful.